Okay, how should we start this? Design time, episode 12. I don't know which way. <laughs> On this episode, we'll go over a couple things that are pretty cool. Uh, I might as well start with the best visual one. This is a E90 rear suspension to scale. And I actually think we might be onto something in terms of making models. This is about nine inches by 10 inches, approximately good size for your table, that is. Improving on this, I just used um, this thumbtack, right? What would, is there other words for this? Push pin? Push pin, thumbtack. I call it a thumbtack, but thumb it could be a finger tack. I feel like a thumbtack is the one you push on. You definitely push There's a different name for this, for sure. Anyways, color coded it for the different arms and stuff, and then it just gave me a bunch of ideas. I did a poll and asked who would buy this if, it, if I made your car to scale and had adjustable arms and stuff, would you buy it? And like 95% of people said they would. So it's really interesting to see when you actually start applying loads to this. Um, even with the thumbtacks, you can actually push on it like super hard and nothing happens. But what is interesting is when you do apply any load to it, you can actually see which arms are taking the brunt of it and it's this toe arm right here. This toe arm flexes and bends a lot. And to support the claim, uh, the E90s have a horrible problem where they break the toe arm mount off the subframe. So the evidence would, would, would say that that is correct by simulating it just by hand with the 3D printed piece. Also, in any minor accident or bump, this toe arm bends really easily. And it's because of its proximity to the lower control arm and the upper, it's a very short distance from here to here, giving it, the wheel, a ton of leverage on bending this toe arm. So what I'm excited to do is make um, this, which is actually now a, a 3D printed arm, control arm that will directly replace these, but it's actually got ball joints. So it's got an M4 thread. 3D printed ball joint. I am gonna try some metal ones, but the printed ones might be fine. And it actually clips in. Can you see this, Jack? It actually clips in. And then it's a really smooth, it's smoother than I thought it would be, um, ball joint. So this would connect at two ends and uh, function a lot better because when you get to extreme ranges with the pins, uh, these arms require articulation and basically it needs to be a ball joint for it to properly simulate. So you get the idea. So you can see that we have the simulation. Building this was really interesting. I actually scaled down the original knuckle. Um, this is a, this is 40% to scale, which is kind of cool. So I just shrunk it basically. And I did the same thing for the subframe, that's also visible here. So again, scaled it down to 40%, making the subframe, um, what size is it? Just to give you an idea. It's about nine and it's about 10 inches long and roughly 17 and a half inches wide. So like technically you could actually print the whole subframe, but basically I made a simpler version of it and mimicked all the pickup points. So you can see it's all OEM locations. Bam, 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 bam. And same thing on the knuckle. Then adapting it to a printable version that is gonna be workable. Cause obviously if you print the subframe, the subframe's ears are only two millimeters thick. If I scale that down 40%, you're gonna be left with basically nothing to print. So I have to like, if I scaled this up, it would be like an inch thick on the subframe. So just to give you guys an idea. So that, that takes a lot of work to do all those things, um, to make it basically a usable model for a 3D printer. Um, just because 3D printing stuff, I want to avoid using hardware, screws, fasteners, stuff like that. In some cases you have to, but just for repeatability, printability, and ease of work, I need to make things bigger. This control arm, if scaled up, would probably be like two and a half inches thick. So that's that, which is pretty cool. Um, on the flip side of things, we had a customer 
reach out to us for some Corvette parts to fit his airbags on his Z06 C6. Um, I designed drag racing front upper control arms a year and a half ago. Uh, that's what this is, that's what you're looking at. This guy actually sent us a video. Maybe you'll insert the video here. We made these for him custom, he used them, and then he sent us an email saying how incredible they were. They gave him a bunch of extra travel because this upper allows way more clearance to the shock. So he was able to get a bunch of droop, bunch of separation is what they call it in drag racing, which is, um, it works hand in hand with the anti squat and keeping as much weight on the rear tires as possible, pushing down into the pavement. That separation in the front and all the dampening control helps maintain that traction and gives them the best launch possible. So that will also work really well for this guy's airbags. And the cool thing about when he sent the email was that he told me he watches our design time videos and that was basically why he emailed us for requesting control arms that clear airbags. So for these videos to have resulted in one custom job um, that we were able to turn around and the only thing that makes these, this is the rear, the only thing that makes these types of jobs easy for us is because we design and make these parts 24 seven. So the cups that weld in, we have those. The bungs, the heim joints, we even have these really sick new integrated stud uh, heim joints where this stud is actually part of the bearing, all machined as one piece and then pressed in. This I designed to have the Z06 pattern and then the base model front C5, C6, C7 pattern, which is the outer holes here with the slot. So I actually haven't made rear upper control arms for a Z06 before up until today, but knowing that I had anticipated making them and investing in manufacturing thousands of these, I'm really happy to say that we're, we have an excuse to do so because these are not cheap. And yeah, the, the whole kit actually will use these on the front and the rear. So the kit needs eight of these, okay? And then it needs two rears, two fronts. And this gives us a bunch more clearance on the screen here where the coilover actually contacts right in this area. And we gained a good inch and a half. I'll be honest, I put a five inch bag in the OEM CAD and his are only four and a half. The OEM arm wasn't far from actually clearing it. So we didn't need to do a ton, but we did end up just adding a bunch. The only thing you need to worry about here is your rear wheel and how wide the wheel is um, could run into the arm. So I didn't want to go too far, but this is going to give him a ton of clearance on those bags for uh, full articulation, droop compression and everything in between. Um, so that's really cool. It's a cool story, it's a cool product, and uh, we were able to do that for him. The next thing that I was working on, it's a mini kit for an E46. Much different than anything else that's been created, we are using the brake caliper mounting position and then the OEM ball joint position. The reason I wanted to do that is because a lot of people have already modified their tie rod location and I wanted them to still be able to get a mini kit onto their knuckle. And when I say mini kit, this kit is actually still capable of achieving the full amount of angle as nearly a mega kit if you extend your control arm. So it's not necessarily a mini kit, but you can connect this directly to an OEM control arm, run around 52 degrees of angle, really strong, bolts on, and you don't need to change anything else. So. That's what makes this a really good kit and different than anything else that's available. Um, this is just a cool example of um, setting our maximums and minimums and constraining everything in a way that we're able to simulate those in real time. So if you needed to know what our range is of a control arm, um, we preset it in the assembly so it's really easy to determine. Moving on to this, that was the scaled down knuckle. It's cool that everything follows. If you are interested in learning how to get the mesh files to basically work within an assembly, a lot of people did ask about that. Uh, I could easily do a video on how to do that, but then it becomes way more educational and specific. So I guess just let us know if that is something that you're interested in. Um, that's for my house. 
And then finally, the E90 knuckle and grip kit um, stuff that I've been working on. BMW has so many different brake and rotor options. It's, it's actually brain racking. So I was able to come up with a consistent product for a dual caliper bracket. We will be using the front rotor. I believe we talked about this in the first one, um, but I didn't have it really done. So now I have it done and the organization of it was really testing my limits. But basically the bracket using two M6s and one M8 was not enough for me, in my opinion. I've seen brackets that use these same bolts and they usually break off. So we actually added a welded tab that goes to the toe arm. Um, and the toe arm is going to support this bracket's rotation and flex um, a lot better than just these three bolts. So the three bolts are there for encouragement and then the toe arm bracket is gonna ensure that it stays there. So this is gonna fit E90, E80, uh, M and non-M, all depending on using the same rotor. So that's what we've determined. Um, Will would only the OEM caliper is, is able to be used with the E80. I'm actually not gonna get into all those details because it doesn't really matter. Other than that, I mean, I could think of more Your stuff. ball. What? Your ball. My back ball? Yeah. No, we can't talk about we that. We can't talk about the back ball? I don't think so. Wait. Actually, me. when, honestly, it will come up. When it's done. When it's done, we'll talk about it. Yeah, I have a product that actually does a really good job at massaging your back muscles and nothing like it exists today. And the reason that is because I go to the gym a lot and stuff and I have a lot of knots in my back. So I gave it to Jack, gave it to my brother, a couple other people, works really well. It's 3D printed and it uses a couple additional components, but it's really cheap to manufacture and uh, yeah, it could actually be something viable. But until I have it proofed out, I'm not gonna put it in these videos. We do a lot of other things. We made that tree puller that nobody's seen. We made a device that could be huge. And we do a lot more than just this stuff. But for now, that's all I had on my screen. So anything that I'm talking about, I'm actively working on. And I guess the next thing you might find that I have a solution for making this body adjustable while keeping it easily 3D printable. I have a concept I'm gonna throw up on the screen and start working on, but uh, if you have any ideas, I'm sure if you can put it into words and, and write it out, you never know. It could be something that we go for. I do know a lot of adjustable concepts and 3D printing is really interesting. Everything matters like we were talking about, the draft angle on that clip that we made in the last video. Same thing with this, this ball clips into this body. The relief cut and how deep this relief cut goes is what's dictating the amount of pressure holding onto this ball and how easy it is to come out. So all of that stuff could probably be calculated, but a lot of it is trial and error when it comes to print quality. So yeah, that's it for today's video. It's something just nice and quick, right to the point. And uh, it was really cool to work on this project. So thank you, Logan, for that. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode where we will have another batch of things to talk about.